Good morning, Northwoods. Are you glad to be in the house of God? Come on, join us in worship. Your grace will be enough, your grace will be enough. Under fire, but we won't fall, we will never be alone. You'll always be enough, you'll always be enough. Now in God we trust, in His name we hope. I know God will not be shaken.
my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And you 
God, that it's in your name that the enemy has no place, that it's in your name that shame has to leave and fear has to go. So God, we praise you, Lord, for that power, Lord, that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for this time, God, of just worshiping you, Lord. Jesus, I pray for every heart in this place today, God. Lord, that it would be sensitive and open to what you wanna do today, God. Lord, I pray your blessing over the offering, God, let it do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, as it says in your word, Lord. God, that we would raise your kingdom on high, God, with the gifts that you've given us, Lord. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us, everybody. You can go ahead and take your seat. Well, welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you are here this morning worshiping with us here at Northwoods. It's awesome to see your faces up there in the balcony and down here. And we know that at any given Sunday that we have many of you, and it's your very first time to come to Northwoods. So let me extend a very personal welcome to you and invite you to go to one of our new here booths after the service. Get to know us a little better by asking any questions you might have and getting our printed material about that. Well, happy fall, y'all. Hope you're excited about it. For many of us, fall means football. For us at our house, that means the Dallas Cowboys. Oh, come on now. But for some of you, it means the leaves are changing or pumpkin spice everything. No matter what, this sermon series, First in 10, has something in it for all of us because we all need a winning game plan from the Lord. So make sure that you come back next week and, and continue with us in this sermon series. Well, ladies, I'm gonna talk to you for just a second now. Here at Northwoods, we've got two great opportunities for you to connect with other women in fellowship and study. We have one group that meets one time a month on Tuesday nights, it's called Sisterhood. Another one meets two times a month on Tuesday mornings, it's called The Well. Both of those groups have studies in the word, growing your faith, and opportunities for you to connect with other women. When I first arrived here seven years ago, I joined both of these groups and I still have friendships from these groups seven years ago. So I just wanna encourage you to sign up for one of these groups or better yet, go right outside the doors after the service and connect with us. We've got women from both of those groups waiting to talk to you, answer any questions you have and get you connected. Well, speaking of great opportunities, coming up Sunday, October 14th, are you ready? Southern Gospel Legends Legacy Five are gonna be right here on the Peoria campus. Let's watch the video. Get ready for an inspiring, uplifting, life-giving gospel music experience with Legacy Five. God's word hidden deep in my heart. Legacy 5 at Northwoods Community Church Auditorium, Sunday, October 14th at 6 p.m. Having God's word is a comfort to know. Tickets are $10 and available online at northwoods.church. Your ticket for this special evening will include a live recording for their new album. Having God's word is a comfort to know. So you're not gonna wanna miss that. It's gonna be a great evening. They're phenomenally talented. And in addition, they're going to be recording their album live here, so you get to be a part of that. Get your tickets online or in our bookstore. Well, our men's groups do something pretty amazing once a year, and it's called the annual free oil change for single moms and widows. And women, if you fit in one of those groups, I wanna encourage you to sign up to have this done to your car, but you do have to sign up and register because the guys need to know the make and model of your car to have the right oil filter and other tools and materials needed to do that. So make sure you sign up for that. And guys, if God has gifted you with mechanical ability abilities and talents and skills, join one of these teams to do these oil changes. You can sign up at any of our information centers to be a part of one of those teams. Well, that's it for the announcements. Let's get ready to have an amazing service together.
and score. How are you guys doing today? Awesome. You sounded good in worship. I had to be listening backstage because we had a little Israel meeting. You know, some of us are going again in November. So uh, if you haven't been on that trip, sign up, all right? It's going to be great. It is so good to be back after uh, a weekend away last week where we celebrated my dad's 94th birthday. Can you believe that? 94 years. Actually, his... Uh, his birthday is this coming Tuesday, but when you're that old, you just celebrate him early because in case something happens, you know, you don't make it. I'm so glad for the long life God's given him and, and the fact that now at 94, he's still relatively healthy. He's just ready to go home, you know? Uh, feels like his job's done here, so he just sitting in a chair listening to Southern Gospel music and, uh, and ready to go, but I'm, I'm grateful for how good God has been to him. Hey, let's give it up for our other campuses, our online family that's watching today as well. Good to have you guys here. And uh, you know, we have a, a great story. Sometimes these things happen. This one was a combination of our, our campuses and our online ministry. And uh, I just want you guys to know sometimes, and so I, I was like, when, when I heard this story, I go, I gotta I got tell you what happened. And this was about a, a guy named Will who attended uh, online was watching online August 24th, which was our baptism weekend, our lake baptism. And uh, apparently Will was watching on a Saturday night, but sometime that week he'd been in Georgia and uh, through a street corner preacher, he heard some preaching or, or something and, and it connected with his heart and this guy gave his life to Christ. And so he's back here watching online and he's seeing the baptisms and he wants to be baptized, but he's thinking, there's no way that my work schedule would allow me to get to Northwoods on a weekend, at least the Peoria campus. So through a flurry of emails and talking back and forth, they realize this guy's in Canton. So we let him know that we have a Canton campus. And sure enough, they connected with him. And so the first weekend of September, he goes to our Canton campus. He's asking around about whether he can be baptized and so just this past weekend, our campus pastor there in Canton, Jason Gilmore, had the opportunity of baptizing Will in somebody's swimming pool over there in Canton. Is that awesome? That's, way to go, Will. Way to go, Canton. And this past Tuesday, when Jason was telling me about it, he said, you know how at the beginning of the year, all of our campuses kind of pray about, Lord, what, what? what we'd like to see in terms of people who come to Christ and how many baptisms based on what we saw last year. You know, what, what's a faith goal? And Jason told me, my faith goal based upon the year before is that we might see 21 people baptized this year at our Canton campus. Do you know that Will was number 21? <laughs> and so listen, that, that's awesome. And you got three months to go. We're praying that God will continue to send Wills like that to all of our campuses. Well, we're at week three of our series, First and Ten, and we're looking at some of the parallels between winning at football and winning at life. And the first week we learned that if we want to win at life, we've got to learn to listen to our coach, primarily as he has revealed his will through the game plan for life, that is the Bible. And we talked about four levels of listening and how we want to develop to that fourth level where we're obeying what the coach says. And then last week, John helped us understand that we need to huddle up often, but we also need to know that we got the right people in our huddle. And he talked about making sure we got prayer warriors, soul sharpeners, truth tellers, and life givers in the huddle with us if we want to be all that God wants us to be. So the question was, have you surrounded yourself with people who are helping you become all that you can be. I remember a quote years ago from a person who said, my, my friends laughed at my dreams and told me I couldn't do it, so I did something about it. I went out and found, found me some new friends. Right? If you're going to be all that God wants you to be, you've got to huddle up often, but you've got to make sure you've got the right people in the huddle. Now today at part three, we want to look at another critical lesson from the gridiron, and that is to find your position. Or better said, play the position you were designed to play. There's nothing worse than someone who's playing out of position either because they don't know what their position should be or because they don't like the position they were made for. Consequently, they end up trying to play someone else's position. 
For instance, I think Aaron Rodgers is a pretty good quarterback. Now, come on, whether you like Green Bay or not, that guy's a pretty good quarterback. And if you've ever seen him throw the ball, you kind of get the idea, I think he was designed to do that. But let's say that uh, maybe the Packers decided to play him as a left guard. Well, come on, he's big, he's 6'2", 225 pounds. But if you've ever looked at offensive linemen, he doesn't look like an offensive lineman. Somebody does. Let's say that Lane Taylor left guard of the Packers. I want you to see Lane Taylor. There he is, kind of giving Rodgers the hand. There's their hand. Lane, Lane is the heaviest guy on the Packers team, okay? He's our starting left guard. He's six foot three. He's 325 pounds. Kind of looks like a left guard. Let's say Lane Taylor gets ticked off. Why? Because Quarterbacks get all the ink. Everybody knows the quarterbacks, right? I say Aaron Rodgers, you know Aaron Rodgers. I say Lane Taylor, who's that? We don't pay attention to left guards, right? You watch a game today or whatever, you're not gonna be paying attention to left guard. And so Lane doesn't like the fact that it's all about Aaron Rodgers. Not only that, Aaron Rodgers just signed a contract this year that pays him $33.5 million dollars a year to play quarterback. Lane Taylor makes a measly $5.5 million to play left tackle. $28 million more going to the guy that I've got to protect. So he makes a big stink about it, goes to the Packers and say, I think that we should be able to switch positions. The Packers agree, you know, it's kind of like, well, yeah, Aaron's getting all the ink. Let's put Aaron at left guard and let's make Lane Taylor the quarterback. I want you to think about it. Same team, same people, just two positions switched, and this team will go from likely a playoff caliber team to 0 and 16. Why? Got same people on the team. No, the issue is you've got the right people, you've got them playing the wrong positions. That happens in life. Happens in churches, happens on football teams. And so I want to say today that finding and playing the position you were designed to play is as critical to your success in life and our success as a church as it is to the success of any f- football team. I want to stop right here, and I want to just talk to our campuses for a little bit. I'm talking Princeton, Canton, Chile, Galesburg. If I talk to your campus pastors, the number one issue I will hear generally is, man, we just, we just need some more people to get out of the seats and get on the playing field. Same with the Peoria campus, right? No church will become everything it could be if there are people in the stands who should be finding the position and playing, but they're sitting there for whatever reason, oh, not gonna do it. And I'm just saying, go to your campus pastor and say, I'm ready to get in the game as a result of what you hear today because it'll make our churches stronger and we'll be able to reach more people if you're playing your position. The only way to truly win in life and be all you can be for the kingdom is to discover the position God wants you to play and then to do all you can do to become the best you can be at that position. So I want to address three keys to finding and playing the position that you were meant to play. And for some of you, this might be a little bit of review. For others of you, it's going to be new. And you, you, you might be saying, well, how do I find that position? I'm kind of new around here, or I'm a new believer. In this, I, I don't understand what you mean by finding and playing my position. I want to give you three keys to that, all right? Here's key number one, and it always starts here. Key number one is discover your spiritual gifts. And I say gifts because you have more than one. You probably have a primary, but you at least have some secondary gifts. And if you're a follower of Jesus, God has gifted you because he has a position he wants you to play. Look at what Peter says here, 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received. I love that 
gift there. That's the word charismata or charismatic. You know, some, some people have hijacked that to say, are you charismatic? You speak in tongues and this type of thing. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're charismatic. The Holy Spirit entered your life and he comes in as the gift of God, and then he releases gifts, charismata. He releases gifts in your life because he wants to position you to play and do something significant for the kingdom of God. So uh, three things I just want you to notice here. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are gifted. A second thing, God gave you those gifts for you to use. They're not there in your life for decoration, or to impress anybody. He says each of you should use the gift God's given you. And then the reason to serve others. This is how God gets glory through your life is that you get out of the seat and you use the gift he's given you to serve other people. And so I just, I just want you to understand this. That it's in discovering your spiritual gifts that you actually identify your job description in the body of Christ, where you're to position yourself. But, but, but just understand today, if, you, if the Holy Spirit's living in you, you gave your life to Jesus, Holy Spirit came in, he has gifted you. So look at that person next to you, you know they're a believer, and just go, you're gifted. Let them know, you're, you're gifted, because you really are. That's what the Bible says. Now, Peter goes on in this passage to identify two broad categories of gifts. Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to start up here with spiritual gifts, and we're going to narrow them and narrow them and narrow them and narrow them so that we have this well-tipped arrow for you to understand what it means to play your position. Spiritual gifts is where it starts. So that's kind of broad. Now, Peter's going to tell us in the next verse, use your gift, but he's going to say, just narrowing that funnel a little bit more, the gifts fall into speaking or serving gifts. Look what he says. 1 Peter 4, verse 11, if anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If that's your gift, then you use that gift to speak as speaking the very words of God. And if anyone serves, that's a broad category of serving, he should do it with the strength God provides. Why? So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. That's talking about God getting glory through your life by you using your gifts. Now, are your gifts speaking? Are your gifts serving? So in the broadest sense of spiritual gifts and identifying what yours may be, ask yourself this question right now. In serving Jesus, do I tend to gravitate more towards using my mouth or using my hands? Do I find myself gravitating towards preaching, teaching, motivating, inspiring, encouraging, coaching, leading, mentoring, singing, all those things that require my mouth? Or do I find myself more motivated by doing things with my hands? Using my hands and my mind, not that you're not using your mind when you speak, sometimes we don't, but using our minds in serving and organizing and planning and implementing and strategizing, building. See, once... Once you've figured out the broad category, speaking or serving, mouth or hands, in which your gifts fall, you're getting a better idea of the position God has wired you to play. Now, we're going to take speaking and serving, and we're going to narrow them in a little bit further through some of the lists that the Bible gives us of particular spiritual gifts. I want you to see how any gift falls into either a speaking or a serving gift. So Romans 12 Six to eight gives us, none, none of these lists in the Bible, I, I, at least I don't believe they're meant to be exhausted. There are probably more gifts than, than any of the lists give us. But here's one of the clearest gift, uh, lists of gifts, Romans 12, six to eight. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. So nobody else is designed to play your position. You've got different gifts and you've got different grace on that gift. And that's part of your, is what positions you as well. Look at this. If a man's or woman's gift is prophesying, it's a speaking gift, all right? Let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, now understand, using your hands is serving, but there is a serving gift. If you have a serving gift, you're kind of one of those that goes, oh man, I don't care what I do, just put, put me to work. I just like to serve, all right? That's a unique spiritual gift. And it, it, if it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, there's a speaking gift, let him teach. If it's encouraging, again, there's a speaking gift, but using it to encourage. 
So let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, you know why some of you just, you know, for, for some of you, you, you give because that's what Christians are supposed to do. You give out of your role. You know there are others of you, you come alive when there's a need you can meet. Do you know that's a spiritual gift? That giving is a spiritual gift? That, that's a serving gift. You, you, you go, man, how can, I, how, how can I use what I have to, to serve somebody else? So it says just if you have that, then give generously. If it is leadership, that can probably go either way. Is it leadership in front where you're using your mouth a lot? Is it behind the scenes where you're organizing and strategizing and all of those types of things? And then if it's showing mercy. You know, mercy is a serving gift. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. But you see how we take speaking and serving, and now we're talking about particular gifts. And, and when you begin to understand your gift, you start thinking, oh, that's maybe how God's wired me up in the position he wants me to play. So these are more specific expressions of speaking and serving. I want you to know that all are necessary. It's a beautiful thing when the body of Christ is functioning with each member using their gifts. Even in the exact same situation, people with different spiritual gifts will view the same situation differently and will respond in a way that brings completeness to the body of Christ. So imagine that each spiritual gift is represented as a family member at the supper table. And some of you may remember me uh, teaching on this before, uh, that if someone dropped their dessert at the supper table and the spiritual gifts are people around the table, this is kind of what will happen, all right? So the, the, the dessert gets dropped. The person sitting there kind of crying because they made him, oh, I dropped my dessert, you know, this type of thing. Mercy, first thing mercy will do, they'll come over, put an arm around that person and cry with them and go, oh, I'm really sorry you dropped your dessert, but it's okay, you know, I'm here to help you. You know, that's what mercy does. First thing, just get the arm around that person. Intercession would immediately begin to pray for the situation, that God would bring relief to the situation and heal any wounds of shame in the heart of the person who dropped their dessert. You know, God just break them free of that, you know, that bondage to dropping their dessert or whatever. You know, they just pray. Giving would say, hey, don't worry about it. I'll be happy to buy you another dessert. No problem. Pastor would say, and I'll take up the offering so everyone who needs a dessert can have one, you know. <laughs> Serving would say, Right? Mercy's going to come over and wrap their arms around. Serving's going to go, you know what? I'm going to help clean this thing up. Teaching would say, you know, I've discovered a four point plan for how to keep this from happening again. It's called Stop the Drop, and I put it in an acrostic that spells stop. Does that sound like somebody? Uh, all right. Leadership would say, Jim, could you get the mop? Sue, could you pick up the dessert? Uh, Mary, could you and Amy make another dessert? You know, this type of thing. You just see how everybody's responding to the same situation through a different lens. It's through their gifting. And is any one of those right or wrong? No, the body needs all of them. See? And there are certainly more spiritual gifts than these, but, but you get the point. We will all tend to naturally gravitate towards areas of ministry that correspond to our spiritual gifting, and we will respond to situations accordingly. So I was giving you some ideas about how you respond to situations. I want you to know each gift is good and necessary. One is not better than the other. In fact, there's one thing I'm going to pray about today. The Bible says there is no room in the body of Christ for gift comparison. Some of you haven't gotten out of the seat into the game yet because you think, well, I, I see how somebody else does and I could just never do it like that. That's not what God asks you. He said, I want you to understand your gifting and to get in the game and use it. So we're going to break off gift comparison. And then there's gift inferiority. Some of you just, you feel so inferior because everybody else has more wonderful gifts than you have. Or there's gift envy. Well, if only my gift could be like them. We're cutting that stuff off today. God has wired you to play the position that only you can play. And you're going to see through, uh, as we go further, how he's uniquely wired you up differently than anybody else. L look at what, you might want to underline this verse. I, I, I love this verse. It's within the context of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. God has arranged the parts of the body. He's talking the parts of the body according to their giftedness. Every one of them, just as he wanted them. That means God has wired you for the position he wants you to play. 
And friend, your greatest contribution in life and in the church will simply be through finding the position that enables you to use the spiritual gifts God has given you. Nothing good happens when people decide to play a position that is inconsistent with their spiritual gifting. You will never feel like you're winning in life if you feel like you're in the wrong place or if you keep trying to do what you're not gifted to do. I love what author Paul Dixon said, never try to teach a pig to sing. It wastes your time and it annoys the pig. It's not what a pig was designed to do, right? So if you're gonna play the position God has designed you to play, it begins with discovering your spiritual gifts, okay? Pretty broad, spiritual gifts, speaking and serving brings them in here. Then some of the particulars bring them in here. Now we're gonna add a couple of other things that are gonna really help narrow them in. So you've gotta discover your spiritual gifts. Here's key number two. You gotta discover, or you gotta discern your personal shape. Discern your personal shape. That simply means that if you want to play the position you're most naturally wired to play, you have to understand something about your shape. And we teach about shape around here. So again, this may be just, for some of you, review. But for others of you, this is going to make a difference in helping you to understand the position that you should play. Back to the football analogy. Lane Taylor probably understands that at six foot three and 325 pounds, he has only to look in the mirror to understand physically, I'm probably not designed to play quarterback. It's likely the line is where I should be, right? I'm designed like an offensive lineman. I'm shaped like an offensive lineman physically, all right? Similarly, God has shaped you for the position he wants you to play, and the more closely your life and ministry, listen, the more closely your life and ministry flow out of your shape, the more fruitful and fulfilled you're going to be. Now, we've taught this many times before around here, but I just want to give an overview to those of you for whom this may be new to help you understand what I mean by your shape, what it means to play the position for which God has uniquely shaped you. And we've all, uh, so, so your shape consists of five factors that spell the word shape. And we've already looked at the first one because that's where we start. We start with spiritual gifts. All right, so you gotta understand what your spiritual gifts are. Speaking, serving, mouth, hands. And then narrowing into some of those. But now you're gonna add to your spiritual gifts some other things that really begin to bring the funnel in. Here's the H to your shape, and that is your heart. When we talk about your heart, we're asking the question, what am I passionate about? See, the closer you get to linking up your spiritual gifts with things you're passionate about, the more fruitful and effective you're going to be. For example, now I'm going to take my wife. I'm going to talk about her a little bit. Is that okay, honey? Uh, uh, She, if you would ask me what her spiritual gifts are, Uh, And again, she has combinations of gifts, but I would say two of her primary gifts, one's mercy and one's teaching. Susan can't pray for anybody without starting to cry. I'm like, okay, here we go again. Not really, it's okay, honey, it's cute, you know. She she puts her arms around him and she just begins to cry as she's praying for him. That's a mercy gift coming through. That's probably why she likes Hallmark movies. I got any more Hallmark ladies in the house? You know, I... I'll actually sit there and watch sometimes, but I know she's seeing it for the hundredth time, and she's sitting over there going, (laughs) I'm like, honey, you've seen this a hundred times, you know how it ends. That's that mercy thing, right? She also has a teaching gift. I have a teaching gift. She has a teaching gift. But you know what she's passionate about? You put her in a room full of kids, and she comes a lot. It's like the best moment of her week. And not only that, but the kids get fired up when Susan's using her teaching gift because of the passion that's coming through. Now, you put me down there. I got a teaching gift. You put me down there with the kids, they'll be begging mom and dad, come get them. And listen, I I love kids, but it's not my passion when it comes to how I use my teaching gift. So you see how your heart or passion will help you focus your spiritual gifts and refine even more the position you're wired to play. So ask yourself that question. What, 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 just, what am I fired up about? What gets, just my heart just begins to beat fast when I get to do that. Okay? So your spiritual gifts and your heart narrows it. And then here's a third one, your abilities. I don't always know the difference 
all together between some of your natural abilities and your spiritual gifts. I just know spiritual gifts come to your life the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ. You might have had a natural ability in teaching, but I'll tell you when the Spirit, when, when the, the Spirit of God releases a spiritual gift of teaching, there's an anointing on that that even takes the natural to another level. But I'm just saying, I'm looking at, again, go back to my wife. When, when it comes to teaching with children, she has a heart for children, but she's not gonna just stand up there and read something out of a book. She's got abilities and crafts and creativity that she's always thinking about. How can I bring this thing alive? You know, we gotta build something for the kids. I want the kids to make something, or I'm gonna make something for them, you know? Maybe not every teacher comes through that lens because that's not their natural abilities, but Susan's just wetting her abilities with that. Case in point, you have a spiritual gift of serving, but there's something about serving those who are going through special challenges. Man, if I could just build that ramp for the, the person on the, with the wheelchair that needs it, you know, this type of thing. Or, or maybe, you have a, maybe you have an ability, a special ability in auto mechanics. So when you hear that we're gonna, we're gonna need auto mechanics who are gonna work on cars, or do oil changes for single moms, man, your heart starts going like that. You, you see what I'm saying? That's your spiritual gift of serving wedded to your your heart, your passion for those special challenges wedded to your abilities and auto mechanics. And it's a beautiful thing when the body of Christ functions this way. You don't want me working on your car, guaranteed. Speaking of abilities, our missions pastor, Craig Smith, informed me this week that we need four to six more carpenter or construction workers for a team we're sending to Brazil like a couple days after Easter and into early May of 2000. 2019, who will travel to our Campo Grande church in Rio. This is a church that we had the privilege of helping to plant this past January. Remember they built for like 350 and they had like 1,500 people there on their first Sunday? They've got like seven acres with amazing facilities that are just waiting to be built out. And we were there in April and I got to preach there. This, this was that incredible church. We need some people with abilities in construction and carpentry who have a passion for missions, who have spiritual gifts in serving, to go here, and I'm telling you what, you're gonna, you're gonna knock some stuff out for their facility, that, and you're gonna come home going, wow, that was amazing. Why? Because you are positioned to use what God has placed in you. Now, if, if you're one of those, and this is bringing something alive in you, you can make application through our website or by talking to Craig Smith, our missions pastor. So spiritual gifts, Heart, abilities, we're gonna add one more here that narrows it even further, and that is your personality. Do you understand that God has given you a personality and designed you for a position that fits your personality? Nothing worse than being forced into a position that is not consistent with your personality. So again, back to my wife. She is a teacher, but she would rather be in a classroom with 30 kids than stand on a stage in front of 3,000 people any day of the week. Why? I don't know if you've been able to tell. She's a little more of an introvert than I am. Did you guys know that? And, and uh, I, on the other hand, I would, re guys, I can't handle the, the open seats, man. The more people, the better. Let's go. Fill them up, you know. That, that's me. That's my personality. I get, I get energized by people in the room. And, and usually, if you're an introvert, you marry an extrovert. I, I don't know if you noticed that. You're probably a little bit different that way. And this is really good when it comes down to celebrating birthdays. Because I'll tell Susan, what do you want for your birthday? She said, either just the two of us or just a few of us. I'm like, that's boring. <laughs> I'm like, my birthday, pack them in till we sweat, man. The more the merrier, right? It's a personality thing. Now, now watch how this happens. Watch, watch how this works in the church because sometimes we'll be talking about, hey, we need people, we need people, you know, and somebody's, you know, you're feeling guilty. We always say if love doesn't work in the body of Christ, guilt will, you know, and so somebody gets feeling guilty and they, oh, oh you need a greeter and you, you hate being around people, but you're gonna be a greeter at the door. I'm going, please, if you're an introvert and you don't like people, you don't have to sign up to be a greeter at the door. We got something else for you. But if you've never met a stranger and you always enter the elevator mouth first, you're probably a world-class greeter. And man, we want you at the door. Because why? You're making people's experience better because you're using your gift. And they're just, man, they're glad they saw you. They come in here ready for what God has for them, see? Do you get how personality fits into this whole thing as well? So yeah, you want to 
you, you want to dis, discern your, your, your shape, and that that's involves your, your spiritual gifts and your, your heart and your abilities and, and then your personality. Well, we're going to add one more, and that's your experiences. You, you, understand this. Nobody else anywhere has the experiences that you have. That would make, that's what makes you unique for your position. And can I remind you again, God never wastes an experience in your life. I don't care the bad things you've been through, the hurtful things, challenging things you've been through. I always like to say the place of your deepest pain and wounding can become the source of your greatest ministry when you allow God to heal and work in your life there and you begin to use it with other people. So what do you think when God puts a mercy gift in my wife, she walks through things like losing a child, she walks through things like a brother dying in an accident, she walks through things like cancer, you know what happens to a mercy gift when it hears of other people going through experience like this? It ignites something. And all of a sudden, I feel like I have ministry in that particular place because it's consistent with an experience that I've been through. God wants to use your experiences. And you have unique experiences that nobody else has so that you can step into some of the same things that people are going through with the experience that you've been through and use your shape to bring incredible glory to Jesus Christ. Guys, we want, we want all of you to play your best position for the kingdom, both in your personal life and in the church. I'm telling you, you line that shape up with what you're doing in the world, it'll be the same thing. You're the church out there in the world. I hope you're doing something that's using your shape. You'll be fruitful and fulfilled for the kingdom of God. But here in the church, we want you to play your, posi your best position. And, and we're here to help you discover where that might be. If you haven't figured out your position yet, that's what our four steps is designed to do. You hear us talk about four steps all the time. So every month, we run through the four steps. First week, we take you through step one, which is start. How to get started in your faith, how to get started in the church. Step two, second week, is, get, is connect. We want you to find a huddle of people that are gonna help you grow and become all that you can be. Week three is what we're talking about today. It's called discover. Discover your gifts, discover your shape. And then week four is serve. And this is where we're gonna position you to serve in the church. So if you haven't been through those four classes, guys, that's where it starts, okay? Sign up, get, you don't really have to sign up, just go to the class. They're, 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 they're going on every month, one, two, three, and four, consistent with the weeks of, of, of that particular month. And then we've also put these online for those of you who may, having, may be having a challenge getting here for the class. Just go online and you can do all the work there as well. We, we wanna help you discover your spiritual gifts. We wanna help you discern your personal shape. And then one final key that's foundational to all, right? Display a servant's heart. So discover your spiritual gifts, discern your personal shape, display a servant's heart. And guys, this really undergirds all of what I've said about spiritual gifts and about your shape. It's simply living from a heart that says, Lord, I'm your servant. Whatever you want me to do, whatever assignments you have for me, I'm willing to do them. I'm saying hopefully 80 to 90% of the time you're able to serve in the area of your unique giftedness. But 100% of the time, I hope you're bringing a heart to the table that says anything I can do to make a difference, I'm willing to do it. That's a servant's heart. You know, there are times when a quarterback will have to throw a block for a running back. Now, we don't want him doing that all the time because we don't want him to get hurt. But what we do want from everybody on the team is a heart that says, whatever I can do to help the team, that's what I'll do. That's a servant's heart. In fact, this is foundational to how Jesus defined greatness in the kingdom of God. You know, when he was asked about greatness from somebody, he didn't scold the person for asking about being great because Jesus knew every one of us wants to be great. If I were to ask you, you want to be great in some area of your life? Every one of us have an innate desire to be great. So Jesus didn't scold that. He redefined it. And look what he said. He said, I want you to be great, but I'll tell you what true greatness is. Here it is, Matthew 20, 26. Whoever wants to become great, and I know in your heart, yep, you want to be great. Look what he said. He made it available to every one of us. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, the point is sometimes it's not so much a matter of what position you play as it is showing up with a servant's heart and saying, I'm here to help in any way you need. 
I mean, there's nothing worse than someone who says, well, I would help with that project. But you know, that just isn't my gift. So when my wife has grandkids, she says, honey, could you help our little granddaughter go to the bathroom? Last thing she wants to hear me say at that point is, honey, that's not my gift. She, I, I will get the pan upside my head on that one. Parents, last thing you want to hear from that teenage son when you ask him to mow the lawn, sorry, Dad, that's not my gift. I'll give you a gift. <laughs> right? There are plenty of situations in life where it's not about your gifts so much as about your primary role, your primary identity, servant of God. Get the heart right first, and then he's going to help direct your gifts and your shape. Understand, everything God's word teaches us about gifts and shape was designed to flow out of a servant's heart. There are those times in life and in the church where there's a job that needs to be done, and guys, it's just all hands on deck. Just do what you can do, and it will help. You, see, you don't have to be particularly gifted to help clean up after a hurricane. You, you just have to show up and somebody puts a shovel in your hand, a broom in your hand, a paintbrush in your hand. Whatever it might be, you don't, well, that's not my gift. No, 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 no. I'm here with the servant's heart. What do you need me to do? See? Now, guys, just to get practical here, we're in a, the process of preparing right now for our annual All Hands on Deck event, which is our Christmas production. Can you believe that? Just coming up in three months. A lot of planning is already underway for our nine productions this year. We want you to have the dates. It's going to be December 18 to 21. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 7 p.m. Then on Saturday, 4 and 7. And on Sunday, we're going to finish off with three more at 11 a.m., 2 p.m., 7 p.m. All things being equal, if the weather cooperates, we will likely host somewhere around 23,000 to 25,000 people this year in those nine productions. <laughs> Last year... 1,000 people said yes to Jesus Christ through that production. That's awesome, isn't it? And we hope to see all of that and more happen again this year. But here are the factors to seeing great fruit from a Christmas production. One, good weather that allows the seats to be full. I, to be full. I don't control that. Two, the anointing of God on our lives and on our production. Three, Jesus Christ opening the hearts of people who need him. Now all of that is God's job. So we pray and we trust and we depend on him for that. However, there's also a part on our side because this is a divine partnership. It takes planners planning Singer singing, speaker speaking, servant serving, all of us doing with a servant's heart. Because God's not going to do those things for us. And so as I say, this, this is a divine partnership. With, without him, we cannot. Without us, he will not. That's the partnership. Without him, I cannot. But without me, he will not. It takes both. So this week in one of our meetings, I was handed a sheet that shows that we have about 700 positions, maybe more, that need to be covered over those nine services in order to pull off this event. Everything from balcony ushers to greeters to ticket collectors to main floor ushers to parking lot people to information center folks. We need golf cart drivers. I mean, I'm telling you, when I'm 95 and too old to speak or sing, I'm going to be hauling people from the back of the parking lot, one of those golf carts, and I'm going to be giving them the ride of their life, guarantee you. We need yes packet folks, food volunteers, crowd control folks, coffee folks. For most of those positions, you just need to smi a smile on your face and a servant's heart, and you'll do fantastic. And so even if you don't quite know your particular position, make, uh, you, know, you, you just decide that because you have a servant's heart, I'm going to be a part of this church making its greatest kingdom impact this year, and that's what's going to happen through the Christmas production. I'm going to be a part of it. And you can choose to be a part of one service or as many as you want to be. Multi-site campuses, that's, this refers to you as well. We need all hands on deck. In fact, the staff team has made it possible for you to sign up today for our Christmas production. So this is one of those times where I don't care if you got your phone out, okay? Because you can text Christmas 
all caps, to 309-243-1550. And what will happen, we will get your name, and you will hear, in just a couple of weeks, you will hear from somebody who's helping you select your date, your service time, and the position that you desire to play or the position that we need filled. Now, if you're sitting here and you go, I don't do texting. It's okay. Texting's not my gift. It's okay. We've got a table right out here in the lobby and at all of our campuses today, we have a table. You can just show up at the table and say, man, I'm ready to serve. I want to help. I want to be positioned to help this church make an incredible impact and they will take your name and your number and maybe even start plugging you in today to whatever it is you want to do. Though I think we're going to run out of golf cart drivers because I know there are a lot of you that want to do that one. Here's what I want you to understand, guys. Winning at life really is a lot like winning at football. You've got to find the position you're designed to play and then you've got to become the best you can be at that position. And so if you'll discover your spiritual gifts and if you'll discern your personal shape and you'll display a servant's heart, you will make your mark for the kingdom of God, I guarantee you. At the end of the day, I want to tell you, be the best you you can be because everybody else is already taken. Who's going to play your position if you don't? Now, I wanted to finish this in a way that you'll remember. <laughs> but I want to pray with you first. You just bow your head and your heart. Because here's what I want right now. Would you just, if you're, particularly if you're a follower, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I, man, just let the Lord know, I want to get in the game. I, I want to get on your team. You need to become a part of the team. His eternal team. But if you're a follower of Jesus, I think it would just be good again to say, Lord, just kind of open your hands and open your heart to him and say, Lord, I'm your servant. Whatever it is you want me to do. You got an assignment for me, I'll do it. I, I want to take up my position and I want to I get in the game. I, I want to play for the kingdom of God. But I know that there's some of you right now, and this is where we're a break off right now. There are some of you who the minute you think about doing that, you remember a hurt. I tried once before and I got hurt. I bind that hurt in the name of Jesus right now. If that is causing you to sit in your seat because you tried and you got hurt, we break that off in Jesus' name. You invite God to heal you at that moment and do not allow the enemy to keep you in the seat because you got hurt. Somebody else here, the minute you start thinking of using your gift, it, it, it becomes gift inferiority. Well, I can't do it like so and so. I cut that lie off in the name of Jesus. Do you not understand? That is the enemy trying to keep you in your seat when God has designed you for great fruit in the kingdom of God. Somebody else, it's, it's gift comparison. Well, I, I can't do it like somebody else. My gifts don't compare. I bind that lie in the name of Jesus all across this auditorium, all across our campuses, online, in the name of Jesus. I bind gift comparison and the lie behind that that is keeping you in the seat. And I pray right now, God, a kingdom release over the gifts that you have placed in the hearts and the lives of your people, the shape that, you, that, that you've designed them with so that they can be positioned for great fruit in the kingdom of God. And we thank you, Lord. Every one of us are telling you we want to take our greatest place on the playing field for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Everyone said amen. Now I want you to stand up. I'm going to send you out of here with some hope today, all right? And I got to put my hat on. I wish I had my coveralls. But some of you are going, what the heck is that? Well, this is Tubby. It's a wash tub. And it's made for more than just washing clothes. I bet you didn't know. I, I've had this since I was a sophomore in high school. It's my grandpa's pitchfork. I bet you didn't know that this serves as an upright base. Listen to this. Is that awesome? I love playing this thing, but you know, old Tubby, he got, he, he, he was down in the basement just gathering dust. And when I went down to see if he'd play this weekend, you know what he said? Well, I've seen some of those new shiny upright bases and I'm not like them. I said, Tubby, it doesn't matter. He said, Cal, have you seen them? They got like five strings. I only got one. 
I said, Tubby, I'd rather have the anointing of God on one string than five strings without the anointing. And I said, Tubby, Charlie Daniels has a song he wants you to, to help with today, if you're willing, if you'll take your position. And so this is what we come up with. Come on, Charlie, hit it. And then I want you to get your hands together. Some of you have been talking like you're just that one stringer. You're not polished like everybody else. You put it in God's hands and watch what he can do. Come on, Charlie, let's go. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all you folks right. that listened out on the XM radio lines. And we're going to close this out. Get ready. Thing called I'll Fly Away. Let's go. Here we go. <laughs> stringer, huh? I'll tell you what, next time devil tells you, sit down, you're not shiny, you don't have the, what it takes, you just look him in the face and say, God has positioned me for a place in his kingdom. And when you use your gifts, you're going to bring joy to people's heart. Amen? Amen? Come on, you can fly away now. You guys have a great week. God bless you. If you need prayer for anything, come on down, all right? Those of you watching online, man, great to have you with us today. I hope that song brought some joy to your heart. But more than anything else, I hope you'll just recommit to saying, God, what you've placed in my life, I want to use it for the kingdom of God. God bless you. Hope to see you back next week.